The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 6, from verses 25 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Great, thank you so much, David. And good evening, everyone. If I haven't met you, my name is Felix, I'm on the team here, and I hope this evening finds you well. Um, we are carrying on in this series called How on Earth, and tonight, as has been said already, um, we are thinking about the topic of anxiety. Uh, the title of the talk is How to Be a Non-Anxious Presence in an Anxious World. So I think we're going to need some help uh, with this, so let me pray for us. Um, our Father God, thank you that you are uh, the creator God, uh, that you uh, made each of us. Uh, you've designed us, and Lord, I thank you then that you know how best um, we can live in this world that you've created. And so I pray, uh, particularly with this vast topic of anxiety, that you would, uh, by the power of your spirit, take uh, these words um, and that they would land in just the right place for each of us with all the different things going on in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Alex Navalny the now deceased uh, Putin critic, Sarah, a member of HTC, and Adam Peaty, a GB swimmer and three-time Olympic gold medalist. The reason for mentioning these three individuals is because all three have several things in common. All three have had to battle anxiety, uh, some in very acute ways. Alex Navalny had to battle uh, ongoing worries for his own health and the sort of safety, security of his own family. Uh, Sarah, a city worker here at HTC, recently saw her GP because of the panic attacks she was getting just simply at the mere thought of seeing her boss at work um, in the week ahead. And then Adam Peaty, three-time Olympic gold medalist, well, he had to pull out of racing earlier last year because of mental health struggles, which included acute anxiety. So why start this talk with these three individuals? I mean, you're probably thinking, you know, struggling with anxiety is quite a common experience, right? And you would be right. Apparently, uh, in the past two weeks, 60% of UK adults experienced anxiety that interfered with their daily lives, 60%. So why start this talk with these three people? The answer is because all three have spoken about how their Christian faith has helped them uh, during their periods of anxiety. Our talk's title, as I've said already, is How to Be a Non-Anxious presence, uh, presence in an Anxious World. And I'm conscious that this kind of talk runs the risk of kind of slipping into a kind of self-help TED talk. You know, we could just spend the next few minutes reading off some sort of top tips on how to beat anxiety. Um, like this book, um, you won't be able to see the title, it's too small, but it basically it's titled... Um, 60 ways to relieve stress in 60 seconds. <laughs> so ambitious. Um, it's filled with supposedly top tips, top tips on beating stress and anxiety. Um, some very interesting top tips, like um, top tip number 11, call the weather service 
try and memorize exactly what they say, and then write it down. And if you did that in this country, like, <laughs> your anxiety is going to turn into despair. <laughs> You're going to be so upset. Um, top tip number 59. Um, lie down and cover your head with your arms and let your dog try and lick your face. <laughs> if I did that with my parents' dog, I would be so stressed at the end of it. Now, obviously, obviously, I'm being a little facetious because there is some brilliant advice out there, brilliant advice from medical experts, uh, maybe not necessarily in that book. And it's also worth saying, right at the very start, there is a difference between occasional anxiety that most of us will feel at times and then those who've been diagnosed with clinical anxiety. But whatever our story is tonight, we get to hear from someone who has a greater claim to offering transformation than any other human being ever in human history, Jesus Christ. Just before the passage um, that we had read to us, um, uh, we're told Jesus has been healing diseases and sicknesses. In fact, so dramatic is the kind of transformation Jesus offers that huge crowds uh, from the surrounding towns have been started to following Jesus. And what has Jesus been teaching? Well, we're told he's been teaching people about the good news of the kingdom. That is to say, Jesus has been saying, he's been t teaching people, he's telling us, that if we've put our trust in him, well, you become a member of his kingdom. Why is that good news? Answer, because this is a kingdom that brings life. Life today as it's meant to be lived, and life that even lasts beyond death. And crucially for us today, if you're living in this kingdom, Jesus says, verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Now instantly, many of us would be thinking, Jesus is being seriously unrealistic. Don't worry, don't worry, Jesus. You have no idea what's going on in my life right now. You know, the pressures I face at work, the fears I have about the future, the struggles I have in my relationships, and you tell me not to worry? You're living in another world, Jesus, we might be thinking. And in a sense, that's kind of the point. Jesus says, if you follow him, you're now in his kingdom. And remember, this is a place where extraordinary things happen. And of course, if you were to keep reading uh, the Gospel of Matthew, you would read about the most extraordinary moment in human history. Jesus himself would die. He would die on a wooden cross to forgive our sins, but he wouldn't stay dead. He would rise to new life, promising that those in his kingdom, well, they will have life after death too. Jesus' kingdom is anything but ordinary. It is, in a sense, otherworldly. So when Jesus says, do not worry, he's more than aware of how abstract that might sound to us tonight. He is, after all, in our passage, passage speaking to the disciples, and, well, they've given up their jobs and livelihoods to follow Jesus. They've got all sorts of reasons to be worrying, as do many of us here tonight, I'm sure. So let's kind of, just for the next few minutes, journey with the disciples and find out why Jesus says we need not worry in the kingdom. And Jesus um, shows us this by addressing three areas. Head, heart, hands. Head, heart, hands. So number one, head. In verses 25 to 27, Jesus appeals to the logic, the logic of our minds. The point Jesus is making in these verses is this. Know the importance of your life to your heavenly father. Know the importance of your life to your heavenly father. On my sixth birthday, my parents gave me a remote control car. Brilliant car, so good. It still works today, unbelievable. And I remember being given this car because um, not only did my parents like wrap up the car, but they also gave a tiny little present on top, also wrapped up. And um, I unwrapped the car, and then I unwrapped the tiny present on top, and the tiny present on top was a battery. Because, of course, my parents, because they love me, they wanted me to enjoy the car, and they wanted to give me the means by which I could enjoy the car and drive the car. Jesus says in verse 25, is life 
more than food. Sorry, it's life not more than food and the body more than clothes. In other words, if God has chosen to give us life, he will provide the means for us to live it. Your life is just too important to him. In verse 26, Jesus says, if God is providing for the birds, he will, of course, provide for you. Because he says, are you not much more valuable than they? Jesus says, God will do this because if you come into his kingdom, he will adopt you into his family. He will become your father in heaven, which means he's gonna love you, adore you you as his child. So know the importance of your life to your heavenly father. Now there'll be all sorts of different reasons in this room why we might be feeling anxious today. The stats tell us the most kind of common cause is work. 79% apparently of UK workers say they frequently feel anxious. And maybe as you're listening to this, you're thinking about work tomorrow. You know, maybe that long to-do list, Uh, your inbox filled with unopened emails. Uh, Maybe it's a project that you're working on and you just feel totally out of your depth. Or maybe it's your colleagues. Maybe it's the way they kind of exclude you at lunchtime, talk about you at the coffee break. She's a Christian. She's so narrow-minded. Or, you know, he takes his faith way too seriously. Or maybe it's you currently don't have a job and you'd love to have a job. Maybe there's a job that you want, you desperately want, but you don't have. For Sarah, um, I mentioned her earlier, she's a city worker and attends HDC. It's her boss at work. I've changed her name, but her story is not unique um, to her. Sarah's boss is a bully. Sarah had her first panic attack a few months ago. She's had more since. Sarah's story is so important for us tonight, I think, because, well, there hasn't been a kind of miraculous transformation for her. Anxiety and panic never feel far away for Sarah. Which is why these words of Jesus are so important to Sarah. Because even when she may not feel God's love for her, she knows that it's there. And so every day she needs to kind of remind herself of this promise that whilst her boss may not value her, she has a heavenly father who does. That whilst her boss may not show her gratitude. She has a God who never wants to stop pouring out his love and adoration and affection on her. As she looks for another job, she's purposely not thinking about her boss. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. But she's got someone so much better to be filling her mind with and about. Verse 27 tells us there's logic in this. It's logic because while worrying won't help, I pray, I really do pray that her courage may inspire you tonight to hold close to God as he promises to hold close to you. So number one, your head. Know the importance of your life to your heavenly father. Number two, your heart, your heart. In verses 28 to 32, Jesus is appealing to our relationship with God. If you're in his kingdom, you get to call the God of the whole universe Daddy. There's that famous um, picture of John F. Kennedy, the past president of the United States, reading a document at his desk in the Oval Office. I don't know if you can see the pictures. Um, I tell you what, I find, I slightly stress out looking at this picture, because his desk is so cluttered. (laughs) He's supposed to be the president, come on. (laughs) But this is the most powerful person at the time on the planet. Not many people got to meet with John F. Kennedy. If they did, they'd have to kind of arrange a meeting in the future, probably weeks, maybe even months in the future. Um, His doors to his office would have been sort of carefully guarded by the security service. But there was one person who had instant access to John F. Kennedy. When this person kind of approached the doors of his office, the doors um, would just kind of be flung open. I am, of course, talking about John F. Kennedy's son as shown here in this picture under the desk. You see, John F. Kennedy, well, he loved his son more than anyone else in the world. And Jesus is saying in our passage, experience the care God has for you. The most powerful being, not in this planet, but in the whole universe, he loves you 
and he cares for you as his beloved child. The picture in our passage Jesus gives to illustrate this is of a beautiful field full of flowers. When I was um, writing this, it was pouring with rain and it was looking really horrible outside and I was thinking, quite hard to imagine like a field full of flowers right now. But Jesus' point is if God cares for the grass in the field by covering them with beautiful flowers, flowers that don't even last that long, well, how much more will God care for you? his child in his kingdom. It'd be a bit like John F. Kennedy, back in that picture, while caring more about the piece of paper on his desk than his son under the desk. You see, Jesus is appealing to our relationship with God. That relationship is a kind of antidote to the worry. That's why he says uh, what he does in verse 30. I'll read it to you. Verse 30. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is uh, here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? In other words, don't let your worry kind of take you away from God. Hold on to him as he holds on to you because he's never going to let go. Not long ago, um, my son uh, was struggling to sleep. And it's a bit of an ongoing pattern at the moment. It's really annoying. <laughs> just struggling to get to sleep. And there was one time, just uh, fairly recently, I think it might have been last week, where I decided to stay in his room after I turned the lights out. So I turned the lights out, stayed in his room, and sat on the floor. But I don't think he realized that I'd done that. And so not long um, later, he started crying out, I'm lonely! <laughs> and I said, I'm right here. I never left. I actually said it in a much more frustrated way. I'm right here. <laughs> I never left. Go to sleep. <laughs> but, but Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, worry, anxiety, but runs the risk of kind of blindsiding us from our relationship with God. It can make us kind of forget or doubt that he's there, that he cares, that he knows, that he sees that he's more than able. In fact, there is a type of worry that kind of takes all the pressures of this, well, say of this world, I guess in our lives, kind of onto ourselves in such a kind of all-encompassing way that our lives are kind of lived like those that don't believe there is a God. Uh, Jesus says in verse 31 to 32, so do not worry saying, what should we eat or what should we drink or what should we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. You know, we can be so kind of consumed, sometimes very understandably by our circumstances, that we can, in effect, leave no space for God. I do this far too often. Uh, but the person who I um, came across recently, who is kind of like the flip side of this, shows us the positive example, is Alex Navalny. Uh, the lawyer, uh, politician, Putin critic, who tragically died just very recently whilst being imprisoned for speaking out against the Russian regime. Uh, Alex Navalny was a Christian, and he spoke about his worries and his faith. He was reported to have said this. The fact is that I'm a Christian. I was once quite a militant atheist myself, but now I am a believer. And that helps me a lot in my activities because everything becomes much, much easier. I think about things less. There are fewer dilemmas in my life. Now, I don't know about you, but when I heard, first heard that, I thought, what? <laughs> what? How can someone who went through so much suffering, including being threatened, beaten, poisoned, imprisoned, and then ultimately killed, <clears throat> say something like that? <clears throat> He said, you know, I think about things less and have fewer dilemmas in my life. He said, I was once an atheist, but now a Christian. Given his suffering, you know, you would have thought it could be the other way around, right? If God thinks you, me, Alex Navalny, are so valuable that he cares for us like his child in his kingdom, why the suffering? It's a very fair question, I think, isn't it? But it's not a question that would have surprised Jesus in our passage. After all, Jesus uh, uh, would soon tell his disciples, the people he's predominantly speaking to, that they would go on to ultimately be betrayed by 
their families, and some of them would even go on to be killed. Jesus never told his disciples that being a Christian is a kind of get out of suffering free card. So can we count on God or not? Well, the key here, I think, is in verse 32 in our passage. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. The them is the food and drink. In other words, God knows that we need um, clothes, food, and drink to live. And he will give us all the clothes, food, drink to live until he wants us to die. I think there's something quite profound here in what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying there's more to life than living. Alex Navalny knew this better than most. We are going to die. If we make our goal in life to simply stay alive, we're going to fail. But the key is this. You are on this planet for a reason. And that reason is far bigger and far better than just to live. Jesus is teaching in the uh, whole Sermon on the Mount, including our passage uh, here in Matthew's Gospel in chapter six, is to embrace the kingdom. Embrace the kingdom. Be consumed by seeing God reign over your life, over the church family, over the lives of those who do not yet know Jesus. Which is why he makes the third and final appeal. He's appealed to our minds, know how important your life is to your heavenly father. He's appealed to our hearts, experience the care God has for you. And finally, he appeals to our hands. He says in verse 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Adam Peaty, uh, the triple Olympic gold medal winner, many say uh, Britain's greatest swimmer, uh, withdrew from racing, as I said earlier, uh, earlier last year, because of anxiety and mental health. Peaty himself uh, called it a kind of self-destructive spiral that he was in. He had to overcome a broken foot. Um, he had to deal with regular defeats and the breakup of his uh, long-term partner. And so he withdrew from training, and he said he'd come to hate the thing that he loved, swimming. But what followed is nothing short of extraordinary. After being invited along to a church and meeting with an athletics chaplain, Adam Peaty put his faith in Jesus. He said this. He said, I felt a huge sense of peace, calmness, grounding, and perspective, belonging even. It felt like I was home in a place where people understand there's a higher level to this world. Adam Peaty shows us that for some people, for some people, a reorientating of our life can set us free from the worries that we have. You know, if the most important thing in your life is winning swimming races, like Adam Peaty, you might break your foot. If the most important thing in your life is making money, you might lose it with a bad investment. If the most important thing in your life is your career, you might lose your job or not get the promotion that you've been striving for. If the most important thing in your life is your health or your looks or your children, you may be colossally disappointed. Um, on a smaller scale, just quite recently, I was um, speaking to someone um, and very innocently they said, so when did you start losing your hair? <laughs> Crushed, <laughs> coming away from that conversation. <laughs> Jesus wants us to be set free from the anxieties that all these different things can bring. Small things and bigger things. For some, that would be possible in this life, that this was the weight of anxiety may be lifted from you. Maybe even today, tonight, maybe even during this talk, you've experienced the slight lightning of the load on your shoulders, or as Adam Beatty called it, a kind of calmness come over you. You know, and this would be a, um, a wonderful thing to be praying for, you know, individually, for each other, and we're gonna have a chance to do that after this talk uh, during some prime ministry time. But there will be others 
And to some degree, all of us who don't experience this, not fully. You know, we're in God's kingdom among the goodness and brokenness of this world, but Jesus promised that he is coming back to fulfill and complete the kingdom where there is no worrying full stop. It's a promise, it's coming. That day is coming. Beth Clays, um, a Christian psychologist, she writes this. Uh, she says, we can experience anxiety and depression with our ultimate hope intact. We ride the waves of fear and even moments of despair with our anchor secure in Christ. For those who have put their faith in Christ, our suffering doesn't get the final say. We keep our faith in Christ's promises until the day of his return when all is made right forever. As we wait, God will help us. And one way God helps us is through the gifts of doctors and therapists. For some people, a perfectly good, a perfectly right thing to do would be to see someone who's able to offer professional medical help. Um, this might be you know, helpful for all types of anxiety, but certainly for someone struggling with clinical anxiety. God's grace for us each day is why Jesus says what he says in verse 34. We can take each day as it comes. Tomorrow, well, tomorrow God will have grace for us waiting there to help us. So as we come to an end, someone recently described how um, dancers, um, when learning how to spin on the spot, I'm so bad at dancing. Okay. <laughs> I was like, even at the thought of mine just now, I was like, should I try it out here? I'm not even gonna try it. I'm so bad. But anyway, someone told me that um, if you're learning how to kind of spin on the spot, apparently you try and keep looking uh, forward to the same spot. A few nods in the crowd, that's good, okay. My prayer, my prayer is this. My prayer for all of us, for every single person in this room, is that for each of us, when we feel life is kind of rushing around us, when we feel kind of caught up you know, in the spin of worry and anxiety, we might keep our eyes fixed forward on that one person and place, Jesus and his kingdom. Know your importance, experience his care, seek his kingdom. We ride the waves of fear and even moments of despair with our anchor secure in Christ. Amen.